we are on page 18, 19, 20 of your workbook. If you'd like to follow along, but perhaps even more importantly, just follow along in the text as we study this exciting book together this evening. Let's begin our class with prayer. And Seth Reagan, good to see you, brother. Could we get a mic over to Seth and have him start our class in prayer, please? Thank you, brother. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, and, and we thank you for the blessing us with this time now where we can gather together with other Christians and study from your word and learn more about the book of Revelation and the lessons that it had for your, your children, the early church, and, and the lessons that we can still derive from it today, Father. We pray that you be with us over this next hour. Help us to focus on our reason for being here. Help us to draw nearer to you and nearer to one another so that we can be better equipped for service in your kingdom, both here on earth and eternally in heaven with you. We're so thankful to you, Lord, and we love you, and, and we offer this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well done, Seth. Thank you very much. Okay, we are... Chapter 6, let's back up just for a minute to remind ourselves of the thesis statement for this book, Revelation 1 and verse 19, where John says that these are the things which thou hast seen, and there's the vision of Jesus as the faithful witness and the glorified Christ as the revelation of Jesus. We have lots of pictures of Jesus in this book, and we start off with those two. Then it talks about the things that are on the earth. And I think that's a reference to the state of the seven churches that are going to be receiving this message. That's, of course, in chapters 2 and 3, and we're, we're dealing with chapters 2 and 3 in a uh, seven-part series where we're dealing with modern lessons from ancient churches and we're going to be talking about Smyrna next Sunday, Lord willing. Then he talks about the things that are in heaven. And I think that's obviously chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 4 is this magnificent throne scene and all these different pictures of worship, of praising God. And then there's this image of, in God's right hand, is this book or this scroll. And... The Romans would seal something that was top secret with seven seals. So this is completely sealed up. And who's worthy to open the book? And obviously the only one that is worthy is, is Jesus, who's the lion of the root of Judah and the lamb that was slain but is now standing. And then finally in chapter 6, we start the prophecy. Someone called me last week and asked, I don't understand what the big deal was. What's in the book? What's in the scroll that's so tightly sealed up or locked? I think that's the rest of the book, the things which shall be hereafter. Remember, this is a book of prophecy. Chapters 6 through 22 are telling us what's going to happen next, a preview of coming attraction. 6 through 11 tells us what is to come here on the earth. And then you back up, there's this interlude in chapters 12 through 22. You pull back the veil and it gives you a heavenly perspective of why these things are happening on the earth because of what's been going on in the spiritual warfare and that kind of thing in the heavenly places. All right, so we look at the loosing of the seven seals. So Jesus is there and he is worthy to open the seals in this book and to reveal this prophecy. Remember, only God knows the future. And so, pretty important, particularly if some pretty horrific things were about to come down the pike for you to be given some sort of warning. And that's exactly what happens here. We have this loosing of the seven seals. Um, I showed you a picture last week of just a a piece of papyri that had been sealed, that had been found and well-preserved. But I think this is even better because it shows the, 
the seven seals. And the idea is, is every seal that is broken by Jesus gives us more information. And so you have these seven seals. And there's this pattern in the book of Revelation. You have four that are similar and then three of a different sort. And then to sort of build up the, the drama after you have four and then five and then six, there's this interlude where you're given more information about what's happening. And then finally, the big crescendo is the seventh seal. And in this case, the seventh seal is actually going to be the opening of the seven trumpets. Then you have the same pattern. Four are similar, three are different. <laughs> and, and then there's this interlude, and then boom, you get to the seventh trumpet with this major announcement. So you have this building, this crescendo of uh, information in this uh, real masterpiece of, of literature. And the first four seals are quite famous. People talk about the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse all the time. Remember the word apocalypse is just simply the Greek word for revelation. And so we start off with these four horses. I got a kick out of this cartoon from the New Yorker. It's these four horses are running down the road and somebody says, well, there goes the apocalypse. And uh, so just because you see four horses doesn't necessarily mean anything, but that's what this person immediately thought of. And so we want to study this fascinating part of this vision that is given to us in symbols or signs about what's going to happen on the earth, at least in this part of the world known as Asia Minor. And I, I really like this artist's rendering. I think it really gives you a, a vivid picture of this. Let's start reading here in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come and see. So it's like he, he walks over and then he, he looks in. And behold, verse 2, I saw a white horse, and he that sat thereon had a bow, so you start off with this white horse with this bow, which is what they used in, in archery, of course. And there was given unto him a crown, that would be a, a diadem. And he came forth conquering and to conquer. And so there's this spirit of militarism and war in the air. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse came forth, this time a red horse. And to him that sat thereon, it was given to take peace from the earth, that they should slay one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. By the way, that's not the little small sword that Jesus is pictured as having in his mouth in Revelation chapter 1. As you can see in this picture, this is this very large sword that would have been used uh, in warfare by cavalrymen, able to reach a long distance. And this is also the sword that the um, priest would use as they would offer up animals on the altar. All right, then verse 5, And when he opened up the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a black horse, and he that sat thereon had a balance in his hand. I don't know if you can see that very well, but he's holding up some old-timey scales. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A measure of wheat for a shilling, and three measures of barley for a shilling, and the oil and the wine hurt thou not. Now, a shilling was a full day's wages in the Roman world. And my little uh, marginal note says this measure here was about a quart of wheat for a shilling implying great scarcity. So in other words, very hard to find, very expensive. There's a shortage of basic foodstuffs while there is an abundance of others. And of course, in wartime, you often have shortages of some things. 
but not of others. If you go to the store and, and you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to get some flour and all that. No, we're completely out of flour. We don't have any flour. We don't have any of this. But, uh, but you know, there's a big old tub of lard over there. You can have all the lard you want. Well, what are you going to do with just lard, right? One of the commentators said this was an example of um, sort of some luxury in the midst of scarcity. It's like you've got oodles of candy on the shelf, all these candy bars, but, but no meat and potatoes, that kind of thing, which is typical in times of war. More about that in a minute. And then you got this pale horse, which um, is the next seal, the fourth seal. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a pale horse and he that sat upon, his name was Death. So this is the only one of the four horses of the apocalypse where we're told his name. And this is often referred to as the grim reaper of death. So if you're going to have war and conquest and you're going to have scarcity, yes, some people are going to die. And Hades followed with him. So this is very common in the book of Revelation. You remember earlier we stated that Jesus has the key both to death and to Hades. And so, you know, he has the key to enable you to overcome death. And when your soul goes to the waiting realm of Hades, the gates of Hades would not prevail against him coming back from Hades and establishing his kingdom. And likewise, we will in the second coming come forth from our waiting realm in paradise and go to be glorified to be with the Lord as well. So here's this reference again. It has happened several times in this book, recognizing that when you die, you're not like Rover dead all over. When you die, your soul goes to a waiting realm known as the Hadean realm. And there was given unto them authority over the fourth part of the earth, so, again, this is not the final judgment. This is clearly saying this is happening only in a portion of the earth. Any reference to the final judgment would be everything, right? So, here in Asia Minor, there's going to be some parts that are going to be affected and some parts that are not. To kill with the sword and with famine and with death and by wild beasts. Same Four ways to die were prophesied by Ezekiel in Ezekiel 33, 23 through 28 when it's talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. So those illusions come forth from, from that as well. All right, let's uh, summarize a few things. So what we have here is conquest, war, famine, and death. Now, there's quite a few commentators who believe that this white horse coming and conquering uh, is actually a reference to Christ in the gospel. Um, I don't think that's accurate. I don't think it fits the context. But I do want to read this statement here in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And this is a clear picture of Jesus. It says, And I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse... And he that sat thereon was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he just judge and make war. And his eyes are a flame of fire. And upon his head are the diadem. And he hath a name written which no one knoweth but he himself. And he is arrayed in a garment sprinkled with blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and pure. And out of his mouth proceedeth this sharp sword. See the same sword that he's pictured as having in his mouth in Revelation chapter 1. That with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God the Almighty. And he hath on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Also reminds me of Revelation 1 and verse 5, where Jesus is referred to as the ruler of all the earth. Okay, so there is a similarity here with the white horses, but 
it seems to me that this is just simply a general reference to war and conquest and militarism. And these are some of the reasons why it's unlikely that um, this would be Jesus. Um, Jesus is really named as the writer in Revelation 19, where it's very clear that he's going to bring about providentially the judgment of those that have so persecuted the saints. There's a name for the fourth writer, which is death, um, but no name for Christ. This writer has a bow in his hand, in, in this, this writer of the white horse. And um, Christ, of course, every time he is pictured, he has a sword, not a bow. So that doesn't seem to fit. And this writer conquers to conquer. That's the spirit of conquest. Um, Christ does use his sword to judge or to smite the, the nations that are wicked in judgment. But we are more than conquerors. We don't go about and get converts through force. It has to be done through moral suasion and by convincing them that that's what they want to do. And so that's not what's happening here in this particular context of these horsemen in the apocalypse. And the events of the seals of 2, 3, and 4 are not related to the gospel at all. It's related to conquest. So that seems to fit the pattern better. All right, so the first horseman of the apocalypse is this spirit of militarism. The red horse, is, again, is an uh, indication of, of war. The, the black horse is holding this... Um, set of scales indicating there's a scarcity of, of basic foodstuffs. And um, you can find some for, for real cheap and some are extremely expensive. And, um, and then the pale horse is sometimes referred to as the grim reaper of death, which brings judgments, trials, and tribulations. By the way, it's helpful in the book of Revelation, just like when you see the word crown, you want to notice, is this the diadem, the crown of the monarch, that only Jesus has the right to wear? Or is this the, the victor's crown when you run a race and you are, you are given a wreath that you put on your head because you're the winner of this race? As I mentioned earlier, we're given a crown of life, but it's not a diadem, it's not a monarch's crown. <laughs> It's the, the wreath that a winner would, would receive if they, were, if they uh, were to win a race. Similarly, there's these different swords that are used, and there's different Greek words. Uh, when it talks about this red horse coming along, bringing about death, large, broad sword for cutting and piercing, it's uh, symbolic of war and death and was carried by Roman soldiers into battle. And uh, in Revelation, they are held only by Christ and by this fourth apocalypse. And so I've got all these references here to um, this particular type of sword that is used. Okay, so you've got the, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. And remember, you've got these four things that are very similar, these four horses. And then the next three are completely different. And that's the pattern you see throughout the book. And the next is the souls that have been um, beheaded that are underneath the altar crying out, how long is this going to go on? So apparently the souls are underneath the altar of God and God is there and they're able to communicate with him and they are aware of events that are happening contemporaneous with their waiting in, um, in, in paradise. Then there's, in the sixth seal, a very vivid apocalyptic statement of judgment. And then there's this interlude. And the interlude is where you have the ceiling of the 144,000. And we'll talk about the significance of that in just a minute. So, the seven seals of Revelation 6 and 7, you got these souls crying out for vindication. This is one of the most important pictures of the book. If you miss this, you really miss one of the important themes of the book of Revelation because they keep on coming back to this and you're addressing these souls that have been faithful witnesses and have been faithful unto death 
and they keep on seeing their brethren coming up and joining them with similar stories. And they, they come before God crying out for this to stop and wondering why he's allowing this to go on as long as he is. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and read this next seal, unless somebody has a comment. I don't want to just lecture tonight. Anybody got any feedback about the horsemen of the apocalypse? Or Yes, Mitchell. just similar symbols oh i think they're just similar symbols okay. i think they're just allusions from the old testament that the people that were hearing this would have been familiar with yeah because i think zechariah and ezekiel i think those have already been fulfilled in the destruction of jerusalem the first time okay that good question thank you all right so let's go ahead and read this i find this part uh really fascinating verse nine and when he opened the fifth seal, let's go ahead and put this up here. He opened the fifth seal. I saw underneath the altar the souls of them that had been slain for the word of God. Now, I want you to picture this. In the Old Testament, you had two altars, the altar of incense, which was in the holy place right outside the Holy of Holies, and then you had the, the brazen altar where you'd offer up your animal sacrifice. This is a, a reference to the brazen altar that was outside the holy place where you would come to bring your animal to sacrifice it unto God. And typically the animal would be slain and the blood then would, would go down off the, the altar and instead of blood coming down from the slain animals, in this case, you've got these faithful witnesses that have sacrificed themselves for the Lord, a real sacrifice. And, uh, and at the bottom, the souls are going down into paradise. So it's a very vivid image, uh, I think. So I saw underneath the altar the souls of them that had been slain on account of the word of God, their unwillingness to compromise, and for the testimony which they held, they were a faithful witness. In most cases, no, I'm not going to deny Christ. Yes, I am a Christian. And so in many cases, they were slain. And they cried with a great voice, saying, How long, O Master, the holy and true, dost thou not judge or avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? It reminds me of Habakkuk chapter 1, where Habakkuk is uh, looking at a time of, of wickedness, and uh, the Babylonians or the Chaldeans are um, uh, coming upon them, and it looks like that uh, Jerusalem is, is going to be destroyed, and yet he sees all this idolatry and wickedness among God's people, and he's scared. And it, it, said, it talks about the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Jehovah, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? I cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. You won't do anything about it. Why dost thou show me iniquity and look upon perverseness? For destruction and violence are before me, and there is strife and contention that rises up. Therefore the law is slacked, and justice doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, and therefore justice goeth forth perverted. So how is this going to solve the problem of wickedness in the city of Jerusalem and the, the perverseness that I see there by your bringing in even more wicked people, these pagan Babylonians, uh, up against us? And he just doesn't understand. He says, how long are you going to allow all this wickedness to continue to go on. And God says, well, you, you know, my ways are not your ways, Habakkuk. Um, I'm going to use the Chaldeans to come in and to stop this idolatry and this immorality in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, yes, it's going to be a tough, bitter pill, but I'm going to take the people captive and the righteous ones I'm going to bring back and we're going to start again. Wasn't what he wanted to hear. But uh, he was just puzzled. How, how can this be? And frankly, 
you know, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is, is with the day. Uh, someone has said that uh, God is never in a hurry, but always on time. But we tend to want him to answer our prayers and in the affirmative just immediately instead of learning the value of patience and waiting or even being willing to accept no. We see injustice and we want to leave it in the hands of God. It's not our place to take personal vengeance upon these people. But it is fine to hope that God will eventually bring wickedness to justice. That's not an unchristian attitude. You just have to pray for these people, hope they repent in time, but trust that ultimately God is going to make all of these awful things that are all around us right. And so uh, these are the souls slain underneath the altar. And so God listens to their prayer. He's not upset with them for asking or being frustrated. I think we need to realize that God wants us to be honest and forthright and genuine and authentic even when we're frustrated with his providential workings. It's okay to to vent in a respectful way. And so there was given unto them each a white robe, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little time until their fellow servants also and their brethren who should be killed, even as they were, should have fulfilled their course. So these martyrs, as I mentioned earlier, are giving their lives to God's glory and they're a tremendous testimony of the faith. And these people did not fear death. And it's resulting ultimately in thousands and thousands of people seeking out the truth and coming to the Lord. So this isn't just senseless violence. Because of the way these people face death and die calmly praying for their persecutors, they really told the world and let their light shine about what Christianity is all about. So somehow or other in God's plan, he's going to allow this to continue because ultimately this life is just a little speck on this long timeline of eternity. And if that's how we can sacrifice our life for a greater good, like Jesus sacrificed his life for a greater good, then um, if we wind up in heaven in eternity... And other people wind up coming to the Lord because of that sacrifice? Then let the Lord's will be done. That, that seems to be the attitude that you get here from this book. And as I mentioned last week, it also fascinates me that those in paradise, those who are in the waiting realm, uh, they can talk with God and they seem to have some clue and idea about what's happening on the earth. And that's kind of neat. Now, did they learn this because they talked to those who were coming up, this great crowd of multitudes, because they were being persecuted and dying for their faith? And maybe they, they knew them while they were on the earth, and they're hearing about things that way? Or, or were they like the angels who peered down from their heavenly perch down onto the earth and saw Jesus there and wondered, what are you doing? What does this mean? I really don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but it's fascinating that these people were aware of the events that were happening contemporaneously uh, in these people's lifetimes. So, um, then we have verse 12. And I saw, and when he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, which throughout the Bible is, is always... Something that, not always, but most of the time, Isaiah 2, Hosea 10, Joel 2, clearly is an indication of, of judgment of some sort. And the sun became black and a sackcloth of hair and the whole moon became as blood and the stars of the heaven fell upon the earth as a fig tree casteth her unripe figs when she is shaken from a great wind. Again, this is apocalyptic, which means this just simply represents something else, not that these things literally uh, would occur. And so some commentators think the, the moon turning red has to do with the, the church, which is a reflection of the light of Christ, is going to be 
shedding blood and the stars falling would be the leaders like Polycarp and others are going to be um, showing true leadership by being faithful martyrs. Obviously, we don't know exactly for sure what all that represents, but clearly it's the idea of, of difficulties followed by judgment. And in the heaven was removed as a scroll when it was rolled up and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the chief priest and the chief captains and the rich and the strong and every bondman and freeman hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. So again, how do we know this is not a reference to final judgment? Because when the final judgment comes, is there anywhere you can go to hide? Of course not. So this is something that's coming about and people see this downfall that's going to occur and um, they're trying to get away from, from this. And apparently in this temporal judgment, there was a place where they could go. And they say to the mountains and on the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. So this is Christ eventually coming back and judging those that have uh, done this great injustice and uh, beheaded those that are faithful Christians. For the great day of their wrath is come and who is able to stand before it. All right, so that's the six seals. Kind of scary stuff. And then there's this interlude, the sailing of the 144,000, and then the suck multitude coming out of tribulation. And then the seventh seal is opened after you have this long interlude. And then there's silence in heaven for half an hour. In the first two verses of chapter 8, again this sort of dramatic pause and then the seventh seal creates and tells us about the seven trumpets and we'll talk about that next week when we look at the seven trumpets now before we talk about the ceiling of the 144,000 which I find really fascinating I, I want to give you a little bit more information about the figure of the four horsemen um, Zechariah chapter 1, 7 through 10, and chapter 6, 1 through 8, there's a picture there of these visions of Zechariah. I think there are eight visions in total. This particular vision, he says, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And when the strong ones went out, they were eager to go to patrol the earth. And he said, go, patrol the earth. And so they did. And uh, so they're going to go out. They're going to see what's happening on the earth. And uh, they're not going to be very pleased with the things that men are doing. And so they're going to execute judgments on the earth. And the way this happens is through national judgments. So much of the Old Testament is about the rise and fall of nations. And about nations becoming so wicked that eventually uh, their wickedness becomes full. And then they're ripe to be brought to their knees. And typically, when that happens, then people tend to, uh, because of that hardship, uh, become much more likely to turn to God and to be moral and not involved in the kind of excesses morally that occur um, in the latter days of, of a kingdom. Uh, somebody has said most nations are born Stoics and they die Epicureans. Uh, and that's sadly seems to be the case. But uh, that's where this figure comes from. So again, you've got all these allusions from the Old Testament. So this wouldn't have seemed so strange to the people that were familiar with the Old Testament that would have been originally hearing this message. Now, in Zechariah chapter 6, 1 through 6, it's even got this uh, reference here to these uh, different... Uh, horses and it talks about the the red and the black and the white and the the dappled and most commentators believe that that's a reference to these uh, horses in this case they're pulling chariots and there's going to be war and death and victory and 
pestilence or plague that they're going to have to deal with. In Revelation chapter 6, you've got um, the white and the red and the black and the ashen, which connotes the idea of conquest, war, scarcity, and death, uh, telling them again what's going to happen. Of course, there are some similarities. Both use different colored horses to go forth from God to control the activity on the earth. So the colors are similar, but there are also differences. The order of the horses in Revelation, the color of the horse conforms to the character of the rider. In Revelation, horses bear riders. In Zechariah, they pull chariots. It's a bunch of horses in Zechariah. There's only four in Revelation. So there's some differences, but these illusions are obvious. And again, it talks about um, God bringing about these things and uh, there's a sense of foreboding as a war and persecution is about to come about them. Many people believe that this picture of the white horse and the, the man with the bow uh, may have been inspired by the famous Parthian horseman and bowman as its model. And if that's the case, it could be that um, you'll notice this picture of the Roman Empire it's amazing how from the first triumphant from 60 BC to Julius Caesar um, to uh, Augustus Caesar in 14 AD that conquered Egypt, the breadbasket of the world. And then finally in 115 AD, it, it met its uh, further extents as far as territory that it controlled. So this is uh, sort of the height of the Roman Empire, this period of time we're, we're looking at. And it's also going to be the height of this idea of the, this huge empire with all these different nations and different religions and different gods are united by their lining up and showing loyalty for the spirit of Rome and uh, deifying the emperor. You'll notice over here to the uh, east of Asia Minor and to Turkey is Parthia. And... Uh, Parthia was constantly at war with Rome and was sort of the thorn in its side. And um, several times they successfully defeated invading armies from, from Rome, the most well-known being Cassius that uh, went up to a, uh, a Parthian temple and he was caught raiding the temple and taking away the gold and the Parthian soldiers surrounded him and... Uh, took the gold and melted it down and poured it down his throat and killed him, of course. Um, so that guy was greedy for money and, I guess, died in a rather appropriate manner. But uh, the point is, is that it could be that a part of these things that are being predicted that are going to come about in Asia Minor were times where the Parthians would come in and invade Turkey. And that uh, it's, it's all not just about emperor worship, but this clearly seems to be they're caught in the middle between Rome and Parthia and kind of being squeezed. Um, and God's trying to warn them about them sort of being caught in the middle of this. So let's talk about the, the four horsemen a little bit more. Uh, we noticed that uh, he had a pair of scales in his hand, the black horse. This is an actual... Uh, pair of scales from that time period. He would ho hold the center and try to determine, you know, how much something weighed, you know, by getting it to balance. And um, so that's the, the, the picture there of that particular horseman of the apocalypse. It says, And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So the top here is a denarius from the time of Domitian, and the bottom is a denarius at the time of Vespasian. So scarcity of basic foodstuffs. Wheat, barley, oil, and wine were like the four basic um, foodstuffs that the ancient people needed and used. There's the wheat harvest and the barley harvest uh, in the Middle East, which um, the Bible talks about frequently. Uh, the Feast of Harvest and all that. There were two, one for the barley and one for the wheat. And of course, they would then take this and break it down and then uh, mix it with some sort of uh, olive oil or something so you could make your, 
your bread. So olive oil was extremely important staple. Um, of course, the Garden of Gethsemane was a, an area there uh, of olive trees. And of course, grapes, wine was the, the basic drink that they would have with the water frequently not being very fit to drink. So uh, that gives you maybe a little bit of additional insight there. Now, the fifth seal, as we said, is the souls of the martyrs underneath the altar. So that's one artist rendering of what that might be like. Um, and then here's the tabernacle I mentioned and uh, the sacrificial altar where the souls are pictured being underneath that. And then the sixth seal is a judgment and a visionary day of wrath that's going to ultimately come upon Christ's enemies. Now, this sixth seal is, again, apocalyptic imagery. And it talks about the great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the moon becomes blood and the stars fell to the earth and the sky was split apart like a scroll and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. All symbols of judgment that are designed to, to get our attention. And you want to be on the right side of that judgment. And then it talked about those hiding from the wrath of God. This is a cast of a person that was killed during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in ancient Pompeii. And um, kind of gives you a feel. This poor person was just encased in lava and in ashen soot, only to be found several thousand years later, very well preserved. Um, so that is something that people in the ancient world were very familiar with. Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, so those are the six seals. Then you have this interlude in chapter 7 between the sixth and the seventh seal. And this is where we have this um, very beautiful description and the sealing of the 144,000. Now we've talked about this before. Numbers are really important in the book of Revelation. Very rarely are numbers to be taken literally in this book. Uh, 12 is the spiritual number. 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 is like the multiplicity of God's people from both dispensations that God is going to reach out and protect. So this mark on the forehead is a mark of identity and protection. And it's based on Ezekiel 9, 1 through 8. Let's take a minute to read this. I think this really helps us put this in perspective. Um, this is in the context of Jerusalem being extremely sinful and idolatrous. And so uh, God is going to bring about the, the Babylonian army to come in and destroy the city. Like Moses said God would ultimately do if they turn their back on him. And so... Before he goes in, though, and arranges for the Babylonians to do this, he says in uh, verse 2, And behold, six men came from the way of the upper gate, which lies toward the north, every man with his slaughter weapon in his hand, one man in the midst of them clothed in linen with a rider's ink horn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. So there's this man clothed in linen, with an ink horn and a pen. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon it was to be the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writer's ink horn by his side. Jehovah said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry over all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And then he says, if they, if they don't have this mark upon their forehead that you put there with this uh, pen and ink, then they're all to be destroyed in judgment. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at the sanctuary. So I thought it's interesting. So it's the corrupt priests that are first to be slaughtered because they should have known better and they were false shepherds of Israel. So... Uh, this is a very vivid picture that in this case there was a literal physical judgment 
and God had marked for protection those people who hadn't participated in the sinful idolatry and in the immorality, and they were to be marked for protection. This happened in the first destruction of Jerusalem, and it happened in the second destruction of Jerusalem, where it gave them a signal by which they could escape to Pella and not have to suffer with the others in the city who did not have faith and were not believers. It reminds me of 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So most congregations have a directory, and that's how we know who are members of our local church family. But a man's directory is not the same as the Lord's. And only the Lord knows those who are truly his. And so you had a lot of Jews that should have known better that were God's chosen people, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to have to meet God in judgment. In fact, they may have to suffer a harsher judgment because they should have known better. The same figure in the New Testament is, is Ephesians 1 and verse 13 that Mitchell's been teaching for us on Sunday nights. And Ephesians 1 13 tells us that when we become Christians, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's the same idea. You're marked as one of his because you have been born again of the water and the spirit and you have the washing of regeneration and you are given as an earnest sort of a down payment deposit that indicates that you belong to the Lord. And it reminds me of Matthew 10, 32. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, I'll deny before my Father who is in heaven. He who is ashamed of me in this life, I will be ashamed of him in the next, is the idea. So there's this uh, picture of God assuring and comforting the Christians that uh, though some of them clearly are going to die, that if you've got the, the ceiling and it, the right mark on your forehead, this is all symbolic, of course, then God knows those that are his, and uh, you're going to be exalted and glorified in heaven. Now, what is this contrasted with? Let me skip over quickly. I don't want to steal my thunder for Revelation chapter 13, but I know a lot of people wonder about this. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, and he stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns ten diadems, those are these monarch crowns, and upon his head's names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Of course, the dragon is Satan. And I saw one of the heads as though it had been smitten unto death, and his death stroke was healed, and the whole earth wondered after this beast. And they worshipped the dragon because they... He gave his authority until under, from the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is likened unto the beast, and who is able to war with him? And there was given to him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and there was given to him authority. Verse 6, And he opened his mouth for blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and all those that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. There was given to him authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that hath been slain. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. So this is in contrast to the mark of the beast. You get this seal on your forehead to indicate you belong to the Lord. But uh, he causes all who receive a mark on their right hand or upon their foreheads are those who have... I think in this context, burned incense unto Caesar and basically bowed down to the emperor. The sea beast and the false prophet in Revelation chapter 19 
he, and those that deceived them that received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image were cast in the lake of fire. So you have your choice. You can accept the sealing of one of God's people and be glorified forever in heaven and God will recognize that. Or you can deny the Lord and save your skin for the time and receive the mark of the beast, the mark of Rome. And um, that when that happens, ultimately you're going to lose your soul. So I think the mark of the beast is any time someone practices idolatry and decides that they're going to deny the Lord and create blasphemies. And in this immediate context, it was those who had uh, given in to this uh, cult of emperor worship. So, the 144,000 in the great multitude, here's one, one artist rendering of that, which I think is pretty neat to try to contemplate. But it then goes on in chapter 7, and it gives us this listing of every tribe of the sons of Israel. And it's really fascinating to me, because this list in Revelation chapter 7, if you just glance through it, you think, oh, another list of the 12 tribes of Israel. But actually, this is totally unique and really kind of strange. It makes sense that Judah would be listed first. Why does it make sense that you'd list Judah first in this admonition to be faithful to the Lord? Jesus comes from Judah. That's right. He's from the tribe of Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah. So that makes sense. This is the only listing, if you go down to number 8, where Levi is mentioned as one of the 12 tribes. That is never done anywhere else. Levi didn't have any land, so it wasn't really considered a distinct tribe in that way. When you talk about the 12 tribes, Joseph had a double blessing, and Ephraim and Manasseh are mentioned rather than Joseph, so that gives you 12, and Levi is typically left out of the list. But here you've got Joseph mentioned, as number 11, and Manasseh is mentioned as well. And so you've left out two really important tribes that are typically very much included in a list like this. Who's omitted in this list? Yes, Dan and Ephraim are omitted, but Manasseh is not. He's included with Joseph. And as we said, Levi was not actually used as a technical term for a tribe. So why would this be? What, what can we learn from this? Well, if you go back to the map, and you've got this list of the 12 tribes of Israel as the land was originally given to them, uh, Dan was sort of overrun, and they ran up to the north, and they took some land there from Lachish, and so they became the northern part of the land of Israel. And Bethel was considered the southern part in southern Ephraim. So which tribes are left out? Dan and Ephraim. And what did they do for hundreds of years at Dan and Bethel? Yes, they were known to be the idol worshipers. And it was the sin in which... You know, um, Jeroboam had made Israel to sin. And it was one of the main reasons given for them being taken into captivity. They've actually found archaeological ruins where they found high places at Dan. And you can picture maybe them worshiping the golden calf there back in the day. So how does this fit with the book of Revelation? Man, there's all these warnings against idolatry and bowing down to the beast of Rome and encouraging people to be faithful, even if it means you have to become a martyr. Do not deny Christ, but be a faithful witness, as Jesus was a faithful witness. So you don't want to be an idolater. If you want the blessings that came from Abraham and from being a true child of God, you've got to steer clear of the idolatry. And stay away from what happened at Dan and at Ephraim. For they're left out of this list of those that are a part of the 144,000. And they are admonished that the lamb is to be their shepherd. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at this text together as we close. 
After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that no wind should blow on it, or on the sea, or upon any tree. And I saw another angel ascend from the sun rising, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a great voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we shall have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the children of Israel. So it mentions here 12,000 from this tribe and that tribe and all that. And we just mentioned the two that are left out. So you're not going to get a blessing if you're involved in idolatry or worshiping the emperor. After these things I saw and behold a great multitude which no man could number out of every nation and of all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb arrayed in white robes and palms in their hands and they cry with a great voice saying salvation unto our God who sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels were standing round about the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, These that are arrayed, arrayed in the white robes, who are they and whence come they? And I say unto them, My Lord, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they that come out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in the temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. It's just, they merge the temple and the tabernacle together because that's the Old Testament reference to God's presence. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun strike upon them, nor any heat. For the lamb that is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them unto the fountains of the waters of life. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Picture a, a child who's hurt and is, is weeping, and they come to their parent, and the mother embraces them and wipes the tears away and assures them they're going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. Only this figure is that the saints come to their chief shepherd, Jesus. And so it's a... It's a really neat interlude and figure before you get into chapter 8. It says, And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels that stand before God, and there were given unto them seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should add it unto the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God. And the angel taketh the censer, and he filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it upon the earth. And there followed thunders and voices and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels that had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So you open up the seventh seal, then you get the seven trumpets. And that will be chapters 8 through 11. And I'm going to do my best next week to get through those three chapters because we've got a lot of ground to cover. And as I mentioned, Sunday will be Smyrna, the suffering saints. Any last-minute questions or comments about opening up the seven seals after Jesus is worthy to open up the book that was in God's right hand in heaven? You know, other people may not be able to see God's seal or mark on your forehead. But you'll be so glad when you get to heaven and you can be identified as one that belongs to Jesus, right? Amen. Okay, let's say a quick prayer together. Our dear God, we are so thankful for every saint, either here or online, that is wrapping their arms around this book and thinking about it. We know you promised each one that does that a special blessing. Help us, Father, to understand this figurative language and to visualize these things in our hearts in a way that will touch us as you intended. 
may we recognize that though this was written to saints who lived thousands of years ago, that the lessons and how we can deal with persecution in similar situations today still should live within our hearts and should be a great book of inspiration and, and encouragement to us. May all of us seek to maintain the seal of the Holy Spirit upon our lives and our hearts and avoid ever bowing down to any government or any false gods that might cause us to have a mark that God will also recognize that will cause us to be sent into the lake of fire with Satan. Pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen.